stars are right. Ah! Cultists rally to their twisted idols. Oh, and great gongs sound in anticipation of the coming sacrifices. Ah! Far below, ah! life-laden shadows pulse ah! to the unrelenting rhythm ah! of a beating heart. There can be no hope in this hell. No hope at all. Hello again. It is always a pleasure to see you here. Gaming has been a constant activity throughout my youth, and will likely continue throughout my new adulthood. It's possible that such a pastime will remain in a tenured position for the rest of my life, and this is because of the immense respect I hold for the medium. Without sounding pretentious, I am of the sincere belief that video games are an art form that have a capacity to tremendously impact people narratively, Bruh. mechanically, <laughs> and creatively. At age 7 I got my first ever console, the DS Lite, and I was enamoured with the Mario and Luigi Partners in Time RPG, a title that kindled my long affection for turn-based gaming. At age 10 my brother let me play on the Xbox 360 and Halo Reach became my first ever multiplayer experience, leading me to sharing many a great time with my friends in custom games such as Cops and Robbers, Jump Rope, Joyride and Michael Myers. At age 14 I watched Christopher Odd play XCOM and developed a strong xenophobic attitude immutable from who I am today. And it was at age 17, on Christmas Day of 2018, that my parents very generously got me a Nintendo Switch. And there sitting among the presents and joy, was the fitting end of my folly and a curse upon us all. Darkest Dungeon. For four long years, this game has withered my youthful soul into dust. It has so effortlessly occupied my mind, so painstakingly demanded my affection, and impossibly wormed its way onto my PC and Xbox. There is no place I can turn to that is not tainted with the permanent trace of this thing, malformed with misintent. It's been all I've streamed for almost an entire year, occupied many a section and reference in my videos, and it's poisoned me so deeply that Wayne June's voice narrates my every failing and mistake. The poor guy is having to speak a lot. For the uninitiated, you may gather from my tone that I am not a fan of Darkest Dungeon. But this is not the case. Darkest Dungeon, in my objectively correct opinion, is one of the best games that I have ever had the pleasure of suffering through. It is a contribution to the industry that offers a satisfying mechanical complexity presented with such tangible creative flair and a prevailing love for the project. It is a brilliant confluence of skill and purpose that has awarded Red Hook Studios the title of my favourite game development studio ever. Just thinking about Darkest Dungeon fills me with as much fear as it does raw, unapologetic admiration. With how often this game's name is on my lips, it was fated that I would eventually decide to dedicate an entire video to it. In this essay of terrifying length, I will venture beyond vague and unspecific positive sentiment to deliver precise points and examples of why Darkest Dungeon has held me hostage for four years. So please, recline in your cushioned chair, and forebodingly consult the scrolls and parchments harbouring the forbidden secrets of the uncaring cosmos. Because I'm about to explain why Darkest Dungeon means so much to me. And, in time, you will understand the tragic extent of my failings. Darkest Dungeon is a game that needs no introduction. Any streamer or video creator worth their salt has touched upon, played, or at the very least is aware of its prolific existence. The reputation Darkest Dungeon has afforded itself, not just as a piece of interactive media but as a potential franchise, is incomprehensible for something that was indie published. There are a multitude of glowing reasons as to why it is such a well-known and well-regarded game, but, to me, 
Part of my affection comes down to the story this escapist documentary told of the development history behind the game. I seriously implore you to watch this, it contextualises so many decisions and gives revealing insight as to why the team followed their design philosophy down to how they made the game trailers. For this video I'll give you a brief synopsis and share with you the terrible wonders I've come to know that contribute to my love of Darkest Dungeon. Say hello to Tyler Sigmund and Chris Barassa, the two head honchos of Red Hook Studios. The former was responsible for game system design, while the latter was director for the creative presentation of the art, visual and narrative elements. There are also other key contributors such as Stuart Chatwood, the head of music production that brought to life many of the haunting themes you hear in this game, but for the sake of brevity we'll focus on Sigmund and Barassa. These two were bouncing from job to job in the game industry, moving from studio to studio as bigwig publishers were opening and cancelling projects left, right and centre, many of which these two were working on at the same time. After one night of intense whiskey drinking at a bar, both of them committed themselves to this idea they had been entertaining between projects, a game that showed just how much it would suck to be an adventurer. This prospective project, one that sought to challenge the power fantasy typical of most fantasy media, slowly came to fruition as a result of a creative tenacity in light of the repetitive torture the games industry was inflicting upon its denizens. The sheer struggle these two in the studio went through to get Darkest Dungeon to completion fills me with admiration for how they fought to keep this passion project flying true. They put their own savings into the development in lieu of financial rejection from the Canada Media Fund. They struggled over the most minute of details that became quintessential to the overall outcome of the game, and even Sigmund had to deal with his father's passing during a crucial period of early access development. They overcame so many obstacles that manifested themselves monetarily, emotionally and creatively throughout the years of the game's creation. There's this amazing quote from Barassa that's delivered in this frankly humble way where he talks about the fear of bringing an idea to life because an idea in your head is perfect, it's got no flaws and it's just fated to work, but when it becomes real, all of a sudden there's problems and compromises and reworkings of something you thought to be so inseparable from perfection. And yet, through the painstaking process of having to rearrange the anatomy of a concept they were so affectionate for, they managed to create this cult classic that benefited from their conceptual changes, yet didn't ever abandon the motivation of making achievements truly meaningful through the bleak challenges of being an adventurer. As a creative type, there's something so uplifting about seeing these two guys abandon the endless cycle of cancellation and soulless production a game industry is so renowned for now, in favour of making something pertinent to not just what players would enjoy as unique and novel experiences, but what they could enjoy making as sincere and genuine pieces of interactive media. People that were freed from the shackles of wage slavery and pursued the liberation of creative expression. Okay, I'm getting pretentious. Point is that Darkest Dungeon commandeers a lot of my respect on the merit of the development history alone. It's a satisfying and inspiring tale of creative hardship that bore the fruit of success. These weren't people who planned on making a hit, these were people who planned on making something that was their damn best because that was what the idea deserved. For that on its own, Darkest Dungeon means so much. But we're not just here to talk about the relatable creative struggles behind the scenes. Just what did Red Hook Studios do? to make Darkest Dungeon so brilliant. Darkest Dungeon is a roguelike turn-based RPG in which you field teams of unlikely heroes on expeditions into the most tenebrous corners of this place. It's a game of both depth and breadth, so I'll do my best to keep things following a smooth pace, but I may have to jump around in places. I pray this does not afflict you. Combat in Darkest Dungeon is our main vehicle of which we advance towards victory. Your campaign's conclusion rests at the bottom of the terrible excavations beneath the manor, quelling the vile beast that seeks to destroy the world and claiming eternal glory. Your first party is comprised of four classic fantasy tropes, the heavy armor warrior, the damage dealing assassin, the healing monk and the buffing doctor. Who the fuck is that guy? Together they form a robust composition that, if well equipped, can best even the most lethal foes down in the darkest dungeon. 
This is a result of the priority focus they received throughout the game's creation, and it's evidently intentional that this squad being strong is a deliberate choice. As it's going to be your first party, you want to have something that works well and allows you to engage with the game as opposed to getting dumpstered right at the start. New players are more likely to invest their time into something that they feel like they can get good at, and buying a player's investment is essential at the beginning, especially for a game as long as Darkest Dungeon. For instance, the abilities of your heroes work especially well against enemies in the first dungeon of the Ruins. In the crumbling crypts of your noble ancestry are legions of ghoulish skeletons. Your Plague Doctor makes use of an important ability that involves Blight, a damage over time effect in which the enemy is addled with corrosive poison. Skeletons are especially susceptible to this, making the Plague Doctor a powerful asset. Additionally, she gains access to a double backline stun which, while limited in its use, helps especially to stun the treacherous backliners so they miss their turn and can't inflict heavy damage upon your ranks. Both of these combined makes her a potent support unit and a popular fan favourite for… Mixed reasons. But this doesn't stop here. The Crusader receives bonus damage against unholy enemy types, along with support heals and stuns that make them suited to frontline fighting and stalling. Their zealous accusation makes it especially easy to deal with weak frontline enemies. One flash of their Steam game libraries is enough to collapse the fiends with the sheer cringe of their own embarrassment. These motherfuckers got Tribal Hunter on their Steam and I don't blame them. When you have had all your flesh eroded by time, reanimated by an unknown hooded demon to endlessly wander the halls of antiquity, you eventually yearn for what you have been deprived of. And you yearn for it in abundance. To aid you in your noble quest, you have access to a wide range of hopeless souls that arrive, foolishly seeking fortune and glory in this domain of the damned. Every class at your disposal is unique in how they contribute to the team's success, and based on their composition are able to be applied to many different roles in a genre of purpose, as opposed to occupying very rigid positions. For instance, the Flagellant, a BDSM adjacent dungeon master with a love of whips. His attacks are the bane of the pigmen and Brexit voters, trumping their low bleed resistances and inflicting catastrophic amounts of bleed damage against them. However, he can also be used as a support healer who can grant overtime healing to allies as well as grant massive heals when at a low HP threshold. Another example is the Man at Arms, an old veteran of war that can use his cumbersome Morning Star and Shield to pulverize and stun his foes as an aggressive frontline fighter, or can use his repertoire of team buffs to improve his team's fighting prowess. He also looks cool as shit. What also makes the combat of Darkest Dungeon tactically modular, thereby adding further depth, is your formation. In a lot of RPGs, your party lines up vertically perpendicular to the enemy. You're able to attack and cast spells without any consideration for your positioning, with the furthest most games go being that you put healers behind and the tanks in front to funnel damage into those who could take it. In Darkest Dungeon, this isn't the same case. The position of your heroes in the formation affects what skills they can use against the enemy. A Vestal in position 3 is brilliant, but if they get dragged into position 1 without a melee move, they're tantamount useless. This gives you another tactical consideration, another aspect of strategy to be wary of, and was a really refreshing change from how typically it gets ignored. And this positioning also applies to the enemy. Backliners typically serve as high damage and support units, harassing your party as you fight on, while the frontliners tend to be focused purely on tanking or dishing out damage. Many heroes have a number of abilities that allow you to shuffle the enemy's position and, just like you, they can be rendered hopelessly useless if pushed into the right slot. Darkest Dungeon's combat is fun, it's a gratifying gruel that punishes inefficiency and brings profound satisfaction and success to those who strategize. New players will meet their end time and time again. You will endure this loss and, hopefully, learn from it. But all this strategy and planning can only be necessitated by the challenges you face. If all you're fighting against are Brexit voters, what is the incentive to vary your strategy? And this is where we say hello to the adversaries of Darkest Dungeon's maddening world. The world of Darkest Dungeon is a mad and grim place. Your efforts to thwart the great evil below your ancestors' estate will not come easy. There are many different factions lurking in the realm that will need to be dispatched in brutish fashion so that all may hear of your arrival. When picking a quest, you get an option of four dungeons. Well, five dungeons. It's uh, generally not recommended to bother with this until you have a roster full of stalwart troops because otherwise you're going to find out for yourself why triumphant pride precipitates a dizzying fall. 
The ruins are a good starting area for new players. Enemies typically are focused only on dealing you middling damage without much interference from status effects, debuffs, and stuns. The skeletons are susceptible to blight, weak to crusaders, and their low level iterations are far from troubling, provided you're not playing like a fucking idiot. But when you cast your gaze further afield to the other dungeons, such as the Warrens, this is where your strategy has to change. This sprawling sewer is inhabited by innumerable police officers, denizens that thrive in squalor and filth. Their resistance to blight is higher, their attacks typically inflict bleed or lower your resistance to bleeding, and they are insistent on introducing you to their alternative lifestyle of terminal illness. Here your best friend is bleed and move skills to get the troublesome wonder wall players and projectile vomiting piglets into position vulnerable for a swift thrashing. This is similar for places such as the cove and wield. Wield? Wailed? How the fuck do you say that? As well as the two DLC locations, the enemy differ by type, size, and purpose in their overall contribution to halting your plans of redemption. They have different strengths and weaknesses, different moves and characteristics, and different formations to ambush you with. The diversity of the challenges you face incentivizes you to field different teams of heroes to best exploit the weaknesses of your adversaries and claim victory. A big part of this consideration is the stress meter. Enemies like the Bone Courtier thrive in the backlines, dealing large amounts of damage not to your physical well-being, but your mental one. Every hero has a white bar up to 200 points. Stress damage fills up this meter bit by bit, sourced from specific moves, taking critical damage, and so on. When this hits 100, your hero has to roll a virtue check. Either they endure the mental exertion and become virtuous, netting themselves and their team a random set of buffs and bonuses for the rest of the quest, or they become afflicted and go mad. <laughs> This can ignite a downward spiral, where your afflicted hero starts stressing out the others in the party and soon afflicts them all. This poses a great risk, because afflicted heroes can sometimes act on their own volition, doing anything from shifting position to thwacking their buddy. At 200 stress, your hero will suffer a heart attack and immediately lose all of their health. Stress damage is especially worrisome, because while physical damage can be healed easier by more heroes, stress damage is harder to heal unless heroes have access to stress healing moves. For these reasons, these enemies, aptly known as stress nukers, become high priority targets that need to be dealt with swiftly and efficiently. Parties that fail to bring shuffle moves or have some backline damage are doomed to cascade into madness. This ingenious yet simple little bar yields yet another thing players have to consider when making their party compositions, where just stacking high damage dealing heroes isn't the one size fits all solution to your troubles. The variety of challenges the different enemies present gives you more to struggle through but, eventually, triumph over. And what better a foe to provide challenge than the bosses? For every dungeon, you're going to have two bosses to fight three times over at differing difficulties. The first boss you fight is the Necromancer Apprentice. He's a fairly standard encounter. He deals some damage, can inflict small amounts of stress, and summons skeleton soldiers to fight for him so he can retreat to the back line. Your first party composition can take him on with relative ease, but do not let this make you complacent. These foes are to be taken seriously. After all, overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. Oh my fucking god, he said the thing! Each boss has a gimmick that makes them different from their champion counterparts, and, similarly to the regular enemies, present different challenges that you're going to have to plan to deal with. The Prophet hides behind three wooden pews of increasing health and resilience, as well as boasts very high move resistance. His main attack targets a specific slot in your group for very high damage. This means you'll need a party that can endure the high amounts of sudden damage, while also being able to attack the backlines or work quickly through the slots in front. This party is going to be completely different to the one you bring to fight the flesh, a contorting and ever-expanding horror that must be unmade. Its shifts form constantly, boasting high damage resistance on some of its manifestations that make it difficult to carve through. It also bombards you with numerous dot attacks of high damage that can weather even the most stalwart of tanks. Here you want a party that applies a lot of dot, because all four units of the flesh share the same health pool and therefore will take catastrophic amounts of damage. As the difficulties increase, even the same bosses will present some new moves to take into consideration. The Prophet will vomit, the Necromancer will summon better units, and the flesh will be even more fucking annoying. Oh! 
This is similar to the regular enemies who become stronger, get different attributes, and get reinforced by harder and different adversaries. As you progress, so does the game, and it keeps presenting you new obstacles to subvert. But this crusade, while its noble end affords you broad tolerance in your choice of means, can't be driven only on war and fighting. Your heroes will tire and will need to seek refuge somewhere after their arduous expeditions. The logistics of your campaign rely on the maintenance and upkeep of a special little place known as the Hamlet. After you have braved the terrible beasts and savage marauders, you and your party will return to the Hamlet to plan for the next expedition and sort out a number of logistical affairs. One such logistical affair is your roster of heroes. While they automatically recover from physical injuries, the mind is fragile like a robin's egg. Bruh. They will need to go to church or bar to relieve their stress through either praying and meditating or gambling and frequenting their favourite websites. This process takes time and means you're going to have to cover for a party member's absence for the next quest likely altering your composition. The second logistical affair is money. This is an important resource that you use to prepare your parties before their expeditions, which, in turn, further affects your ability to make more money. Based on the dungeon, there are different items that can be used to positively interact with curios and retrieve loot. Affording the expenses to bring tools such as keys to open chests can pay you dividends and further improve your finances to better fund the equipment of future expeditions. However, this is hampered by your inventory space. You have a limited room to cram in all the valuables you find on your exploration, but you also need to make consideration for what the party will need on their quest. Sometimes your heroes are struck with a yearning for sustenance and must be fed with food. If you have none, you will suffer the consequences. Obstacles can impede your path, and if you have no shovels to remove them, your party will have to endure the stress of heaving dismembered corpses out of a rubble pile by hand. Torches especially are necessary for smooth expeditions. Maximum light levels improve your odds in battle against enemies, and no light at all gets you a delightful little cameo on Live Leak. These short-term needs have to be measured in importance against your long-term financial gains. Third are the heirlooms. These peculiar items hailing from your long ancestral line are accrued in bulk and used to upgrade your amenities. A bigger roster, lower stress relief prices, more slots for activities, training battle skills and camping skills for cheaper, and more. In order to meet rising demands of the more difficult dungeons, using heirlooms to improve your roster's ability to fight and survive is paramount. These free logistical affairs make the Hamlet more than just a calming interlude. This is where your long-term strategy is executed. What parties to make, where to go, what upgrades to go for first, and what quests to complete to gain temporary bonuses that further your goals, as well as what considerations need to be made financially for the differing demands of each dungeon. Financing your campaign, upgrading your amenities, and taking care of your roster are all equally important because they all equally feed back into the main vehicle of success. Battle. And battle can only be achieved through the success of your fourth and arguably most important resource. People. You recruit soldiers from your stagecoach. Great heroes can be found even here, in the mud and rain. You're able to customise their colours as well as give them a name befitting their lineage. You don't need money or heirlooms to enlist their help. This is the one bottomless resource you have through your entire campaign. However, heroes are only human in most cases anyway. Each member of your roster is host to different quirks. These positive and negative traits affect their behaviour in dungeons and performance in battles. Your crusader starts with the fucking bastard quirk, meaning that every time you approach a curio, there's a chance he just takes it for himself. The sanitarium lets you prune your heroes of negative quirks by putting them through therapy for a week, but it comes at a costly price. You can also use this to lock in positive quirks you'd like to keep, which is recommended for quirks that improve your speed and accuracy especially. This confers even greater variety to your heroes within their respective classes. It also affects your relationship that you have with your heroes, playing into greater or lesser affection, and this is absolutely vital for one of, in my opinion, the best features of Darkest Dungeon. It affects you logistically, it affects you tactically, and it affects you emotionally. Death's Door In a lot of tactical RPGs, 0 HP is the grave. If a unit in Fire Emblem is knocked to no health, they fall and die. That person is gone for good, and you're gonna have to push on without them. <laughs> Just kidding. What idiot doesn't immediately reset when a hot character dies? The thing about this system, however, is certainty. A lot of the time you can already see that you're gonna lose someone, usually before the enemy turn has even begun. You feel the dread of a potential restart, 
but there's relief in certainty. You're not sitting there agitating over the small chance they may survive. In Darkest Dungeon, your heroes don't die when they hit zero health. Instead, they enter a state called Death's Door, where the next blow has a chance to be fatal and kill them. This means, on average, you're rolling dice on a 33% chance. Doesn't seem so terrifying until you realise that Death in Darkest Dungeon is permanent. There are no save states, no dungeon resets, and no chance for egress. You may really, really, really like that highwayman that's helped you so far, but unfortunately, that's your fucking mistake. The Death's Door mechanic makes everything so much more tense. The sheer panic that tolling bell elicits, accompanied by that warning on your screen, can leave you inconsolable if you realise you have no recovery strategy. I've witnessed players far better than me, completely struck with terror, desperately trying to click bandages to stop bleeding on a dying hero, even while knowing that's going to be in vain. Even when you know deep down that someone is dead, you still have that glimmer of hope they're going to survive. The fact it may not be fated, that there's still room for redemption, has you gripped up until the blow is dealt as opposed to being resigned to your fate long before your character's even dead. For any of the non-sociopathic players out there, your investment and concern for your heroes is sourced from the sentimental value they hold. You named them, customised them, and spent lots of time with them before getting to this fatal fork in the road. The emergent storytelling of just playing the game and working through this campaign makes you so involved in the fictional lives of these fictional characters. You want them to survive until the end, because after all the times they've endured a bad situation, that they rolled a virtue at a critical juncture and saved an expedition, they just deserve to see the ordeal through. Losing a hero is ultimately a logistical blow, because you're going to need to replace them and train up said replacement to get back to the point the original hero was at, even if you've upgraded the stagecoach to max, but heroes are ultimately replaceable. To me, the onus of my grief at losing a warrior is almost always a result of my sentimental relationship towards them and the history I've built with them through playing. This mechanic also makes Darkest Dungeon such a brilliant spectator sport, which is something the team didn't even expect to happen. Chris Barassa remarks that the unforeseen aspect of Death's Door is it adds to this stake of high drama. These tense gut check moments made the game so popular on streaming platforms because other people became similarly invested in the action as the player does. Death's Door is just such a brilliant mechanic that gives the necessary gravitas to a bad situation, putting players in positions where they have to decide between retreating for the well-being of their beloved characters or pressing on to complete the mission and risk losing one of them. This is essential to the game's vision of making the most out of a bad situation, and without this I genuinely don't think Darkest Dungeon could be said to be as nearly as good as it is. If you're a sucker for games like XCOM, you need to play this game on the merit of this mechanic alone. The efforts of Tyler Sigmund's coding prowess and effective management of game systems make Darkest Dungeon. Especially the corpses, something that Darkest Dungeon would be way too easy without and yet idiots on Reddit pissed their pants over it, yet as much as I love Death's Door, there's something else that is equally as crucial to Darkest Dungeon's success that isn't related to its mechanical operation. This is where we enter the domain of the man, the myth, the legend, and the figure that is the recipient of so much respect, Mr. Chris Barassa. There are a lot of areas of which Darkest Dungeon expresses itself artistically, chief among them being the visuals. It can be likened to a PNG puppet show. Everything on your screen is a PNG image that is animated to move around or sit there taking up a slot in stress relief like the lousy fucking layabout they are. Barassa's art was heavily inspired by the works of Mike Mignola, using thick, heavy, sharp lines and liberal use of shadows over areas such as the eyes that give Darkest Dungeon such an identifiable aesthetic. I know I joke about Stedelnik for the designated furry porn bit every video, but genuinely I'm a big fan of their work because I do enjoy art of this denomination. So getting to play a whole game in which this is how it looks affords a lot of affection for me on that front alone. And this presentation, something that Barassa describes as ugly in a documentary, works really well for Darkest Dungeon. The game takes inspiration for many aspects of the world from Lovecraftian literature. His works fathered the genre of cosmic horror, hopelessness, inevitability, futility, and despair incarnate. Barassa's artwork aligns with this quite well and invokes these themes. The hard lines imply a harsh world, or perhaps even a harsh world that seemingly is rigid in its ways to the player and party until you brave the depths of the manor and see this hellish dimension in which the world's rigid appearance shatters under such groundbreaking revelations. The shadows over the eyes fit to the origin stories of the heroes. They are not champions of honour and virtue, but guilt-ridden and broken souls that turn themselves to this quest as redemption for past errors. 
Much of their bodies are also shadowed, which implies how their torturous history pursues them even in the present of the game. Darkest Dungeon's world is ugly, the stories of the heroes are brutal, and this ugly depiction captivates that. Yet what could be even more ugly than the enemies? While Darkest Dungeon takes inspiration from Lovecraft, it's not a Lovecraftian game. Trying to adhere directly to his works would be limiting, because the most you could get out of Darkest Dungeon would be the Fishmen and maybe some of the final areas. Instead, the game draws upon the themes of the cosmic horror genre generally, and embodies them in new enemies. The Pigmen are a race of fetid disease harbouring savages that are a result of ancestors meddling with cosmic power, summoning brutish life into the piles of pig flesh he had dumped into the sewers from his many failed sacrifices. They wield crude weapons, are dressed in loincloths and torn fabric, and their armour is formed from patchworks of metal. The Wailed, I still don't know how to say that, are exiles and outcasts overtaken by the ferocious fungal growth that overruns the area, stalking the long roads to find new victims. They use claws and fangs and poison alongside the occasional tree trunk to bring you down. The Fishmen of the Cove are otherworldly creatures that use all manner of barnacle covered weaponry to attack you, alongside their numerous eldritch chants and curses to stress your party. The Brigands are the most civilized of a bunch, and even in this game, their design is unique. Bandits are so often the generic enemy in RPGs, their designation is the tutorial enemy meaning they receive little investment in their design, yet Darkest Dungeon's thugs are identifiable and memorable. The Glasgow Grins, the Green Hoods, the Reinforced Leather Armour, the Big Fellas, the Wolf, the Wolf, it's all just so recognisable. The designs are so creative and inspired. I mean, look at the Crimson Court, a gaggle of bloodthirsty aristocratic vampires. Anyone else would have made them some human bat amalgamation, but Barassa says, no, 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 I don't think so, and makes them mosquitoes. Mosquitoes! Blood-sucking, annoying, damnable vermin. It just fucking works, man. Look at this. Look at this. Look at fucking this, man. Yeah! We need to study this genius's brain for the advancement of the creative industry. And the design so masterfully contextualizes aspects of the game mechanics. You have an infinite resource of recruits. You can play this like fucking Joseph Stalin and you're not gonna lose. Perhaps for other games this would be a source of ludonarrative dissonance or a potential plot hole. But for a game about cosmic horror, a genre that spits upon the sanctity of a human spirit, this aligns with the stars in their inexorable formation. The appearance of the Crimson Court contextualizes the Crimson Curse, a disease passed on by the psychophants of the court in the same way mosquitoes act as vectors for illness. Your heroes' appearances contextualize their backstories, pasts as lawmen and bounty hunters and knights and robbers, and it also contextualizes your affection for them. You have names to faces, envisages to pair with careers of success and failure, and that is just so crucial for Death's Door to be as affecting and scary as it is. The heroes just look so fucking cool. I'm using the Duchess class because she's got a very cool design, Your Honor. I am not zooming in on her breasts. And vitally, the ancestor's appearance contextualizes the dastardly story of Darkest Dungeon. From the get-go, this meddling motherfucker seems far from innocent. When you hear the illustrious rumbling tones of Wayne June during the opening, a deity in which all Darkest Dungeon players pray to, there's something just not trustworthy about it. He tells you of the horrible being at the bottom of the manor, of the evil he had unleashed upon the estate, and that he needed you to come and thwart his foolish error. This is why I hold the belief old people should not be allowed to run our governments. The story of Darkest Dungeon isn't really told in a linear manner. You don't follow missions in this straightforward way to the beat of an ongoing plot. You can tackle quests and bosses at the speed of your own priorities. Instead, you uncover the events that led to your arrival through the ancestors' narration and monologue. Wayne June's voice work truly is another aspect of the presentation that just makes this work. Without him, there would be too much dead air, too much empty space, and his delivery, along with the archaic language that Barassa uses for the lines, fits really well with the Lovecraftian gothic themes. The character of the Ancestor, one that we only get glimpses of at the beginning and end of the game, is a remarkably identifiable figure of affluent origin that exudes a menacing presence. 
As you defeat bosses and complete objectives, it becomes clear that the Ancestor isn't the bumbling buffoon we once thought. The exact details of his grievous acts can be found in this video, but generally it's made apparent that the reason all these horrid monsters are around isn't because of happenstance, but instead because of his active pursuits. Murdering visitors to revive them from the dead, feeding Hamlet folk to the pigmen, and drowning his sea couriers are only the beginning of his quirky antics. You begin to realise that the Ancestor was a bit of an unreliable narrator at the beginning, and his word can't be taken as fact. This untrustworthy character's involvement in the plot ascends as you venture into the crux of the whole affair. <laughs> oh no! Across all aspects, the Darkest Dungeon is the pinnacle of the game. It is an area of great importance mechanically, logistically, narratively, and emotionally. The dungeons on the surface are tame when compared against the dark cultist shrines and pulsating fleshy growths. The bosses, these abhorrent affronts to life, are unforgiving and brutal. You can get away with non-optimal compositions in regular dungeons, but down here, a lack of preparedness seals your fate for good. Couple this with the fact you can't run away from fights without having to sacrifice one of your guys during the retreat, that the horrors below are so insurmountable for the human mind that your heroes won't go back down there after going once, that the portraits of your character will flash with the truth that they are but bits of horrid flesh mashed together, and you have a dungeon that thematically aligns with the game while posing interesting mechanical considerations. You can't just dominate the area with one party composition, you're going to need four. And if shit hits the fan, you can't just run away. The player feels exactly as one would venturing into a place of delirious and impossible insanity. It's a satisfying dungeon that gels well as the game's conclusion. The Ancestor's involvement is especially apparent in the final mission. You see his ghostly apparition appear before you, explaining his motivations to search for cosmic truth, and also revealing that his death at the beginning of the game likely didn't happen. In the moment he found what he had been looking for, he ceased to be a man, and became an avatar of that crawling chaos. Life feeds on life, and the Heart of Darkness feasts upon the blood of the fallen, which drips down the dark spires and empowers it towards full growth. He didn't call you here to save the estate, he called you here to sacrifice those you rallied to your cause in your pursuit of family redemption. That's why under the Stygian Blood Moon difficulty, losing a certain number of heroes brings about the end of the world. When you enter the next chamber, you encounter the final boss of Darkest Dungeon, the man who brought you here. Serenaded with a menacing track, almost to the beat of a thumping heart, you carve your way through the first two phases before arriving at the final form. The Heart of Darkness. Now for all intents and purposes, this fight isn't actually that difficult. You'll still need your best guys, but really the worst the Darkest Dungeon got was the Templar Warlords. That's a huge bitch! What this boss does have, however, is a final gimmick that keeps with the ongoing themes and tropes of the game so far. Come Unto Your Maker is a move that appears with no fanfare. You get no warning, you get no indication as to what it does or when it happens. You just get given the option to pick one of your party members, each of which issue a bark of varying bravery. Picking one does this. They're fucking dead. At two health thresholds, the Heart of Darkness will demand a sacrifice of one of your party members. There's no dodging it or blocking it, no delaying it or evading it, you have to answer to its demands. This being is the very earth you live on, an impossible being that has slumbered for millennia before you and made you and your party from its very own flesh. This boss isn't something you can defeat with a sword or an axe, because that would be the typical power fantasy. You lose two heroes to the inescapable. You feel this rising climax as you're left with only two people, and in the last blow you deal to the beast, you feel all the stress and fear of the campaign dissipate with your quarry. You cannot win against it, and in the end, your efforts only end up delaying the inevitable. Everything withers back into the state it once was, you are driven to your demise as your ancestor supposedly was, and a new heir arrives to stop the Heart of Darkness as it returns once more to undo the world. Whether it's a time loop of the exact same thing, or an endless cycle of new heirs and ancestors to this rebuilding and collapsing estate, is up to the interpretation of the player. It's an ending that is just so fitting with the genre this game occupies. The Darkest Dungeon is truly an unbeatable foe, the origin point of that sickening prose that haunts you through all of space and time. The story provides the context for as to why things are the way they are, and stirs up intrigue in the player, as well as morbid curiosity as to just how this old guy managed to fuck things up again for the world this time. 
As much as there is to invest in and obsess with in the game mechanically, it would be nothing without all the work of Chris Barassa and those that contributed to the game's setting, enemy design, and story. Darkest Dungeon will age like the finest of wines. Uh, not that one. Usually this would be the natural resting point for my video, my concluding statement to the monthly installment on this channel, but we are not yet done with the excavation into Darkest Dungeon. It would be remiss for me to conclude this video without talking about something that, just like the Heart of Darkness, makes this an immortal experience. The Mods. Darkest Dungeon on its own offers plenty for the player to sink their teeth into. A lot of people remarked that even before the game was fully finished and polished, it felt like a completed product. The Crimson Court and Color of Madness DLCs already provide plenty of further depth, more economical considerations, and overall, more to do. So imagine my surprise when, on top of this wealth of entertainment, there is a library of mods that can further supplement your gaming experience. Reworks, new skins, entirely new classes, entirely new enemies, entirely new dungeons, fucking entirely new overhauls that make Darkest Dungeon into a completely new fan game. Don't ask me why I play Black Reliquary, because I can't think of a believable lie right now. And all of this is completely free, uploaded to the workshop with nothing but the desire to enrich the experience of other players. It helps the game become even more modular for the individual player, where you can make it as easy or as unreasonably difficult as you please. And please, just ignore the reddit idiots that whine about this, if you decide to use the unbalanced anime class mods that trivialise the game, then it's your god given right to do so. That's what the fucking founding fathers would have wanted. During my playthrough I used a few modded classes to add to my roster for a more diverse and renewed experience. One of my favourite classes so far is the Warlord by CerebralCloud92, Ripperall and Retail. Uh, CerebralCloud actually watches a couple of my videos, so he already knows where this is going. If you've seen my third channel, you've no doubt seen this video, a product of an unhealthy affection for this fictional character and her Chun-Li cosplay. She is a powerhouse frontline tank that is suited to enduring large amounts of damage with her sentinel double backline guard, as well as executing enemies on low health. The artist for this mod, Zap, did a spectacular job in keeping with Barassa's style that makes it almost indistinguishable from the base game. And despite what the countless reddit idiots like to be incessantly incorrect about, she is and overpowered. I hate these people that go around poking holes in genuinely good mods and pieces of art just because it has an animal person. It's so petty and lame and just patently wrong. No eyeshadow? I- Huh? Are you fucking blind? She doesn't get prop bonuses for defense like the Man at Arms, meaning using her sentinel move only serves to reroute three quarters of the team's incoming damage straight back to her. You have to sacrifice some of your other slots for dedicated healing just to maintain her defense, which can drastically limit your party compositions. The regular damage she does isn't that great either, so you can't rely on her to make up for the offensive capabilities of missing heroes, meaning you have to weigh up whether her improved defense is worth replacing a leper or crusader for. She's also just nigh useless in some of the boss fights, taking her to the flesh is a guaranteed death sentence, and ultimately her biggest strengths can very swiftly become her biggest drawbacks. And look, I get it, I'm a bit biased. I got this commission from Zap and I spent over £100 on this. I don't think anyone is surprised that I act a little bit strange the moment the Warlord gets mentioned in chat. But on a genuine note beyond the subjective unhealthy obsession, it's so nice to finally see an Anthro character that is designed in a coherent, sensible and theme aligning way that doesn't make me feel like I need to alt tab when a family member enters the same postcode as me. Good luck trying to find an Anthro hero that isn't just an import from E621 because trust me, I fucking checked. I get it, mod creators. I can play the game with one hand, but contrary to the popular belief I deliberately circulate in the name of comedy, I don't always want to be jackhammering my cock. The wealth of modded content, this showcase of talent in a community of a game that is almost a decade old, is only possible because of Red Hook Studios. These guys made modding tools available, they uploaded videos explaining how to animate and code classes, and ultimately created the framework of which some of the best player made assets have originated from. It's just another thing that makes me smile when I think about this game, to see all the genuinely lovely people in the discord discuss the most recent mods and strategies with a glee that I just don't see in game communities anymore.
And in lieu of all I have said about everything, all the intricate details of game design and aesthetic I've discussed, it all boils down to such an unapologetic love for what was being made here. An ode to creative freedom that wasn't hampered by publishers, or swayed by popular gaming trends, or altered fundamentally to pivot to the fucking lobotomites in the forums. A vision that these guys took a chance on not because it promised them success, or because it promised loads of money, or because it was going to make their careers, but because they were so in love with this idea that they were able to endure the risk of it not being perfect, by confining it to the mortal medium of code and programs where they could suddenly realise it wasn't going to work. And that ethos fueled everything the game has now, bled into every corner of Darkest Dungeon that made it what it is today. I keep watching the game documentary back every now and then, because not only is it an uplifting tale of creative underdogs managing to land a home run in such a brutal and competitive industry on the merit of their talent alone, it's also introspection on behalf of the geniuses that made it happen as to why they wanted to do this idea so much justice. It leaves me in awe every time I hear about the process and how the game morphed from this top-down puzzle-like game into a side-scrolling, dungeon-crawling, heart-crushing testament to masochism and self-hatred. And as sentimentally mushy as I've been throughout this video, it really is just inspiring. It's a game that I think genuinely affects you, whether you dabble in art or music or writing or game development, and it's only because of how good the source material is that people even bothered to dedicate many an hour to the gruelling task of making a mod. As of April 2023, I finally completed this bastard game, and got to experience the conclusion to such an arduous, painstaking, and undeniably engrossing game. It remains one of my favourite titles of all time, especially for the onus it places on its rich systems as opposed to the overt narrative focused most games I enjoy take, and it's one that has creatively impacted me in ways I probably can't even consciously recite to you. It's a game that's given rise to new talent, one that has inspired so many to take to the creative arts with newfound appreciation for the human predisposition to making silly little things with a piece of your soul. This is why Darkest Dungeon means so much to me. And now all I can do at this juncture is, in the vain hope that anyone from Red Hook Studios will ever see this, that Chris Barassa himself will see this, issue an extremely sincere and eternal thank you for this agonizing slice of fun. You sick bastard! Hey guys, thank you very much for watching the video, I appreciate it. Uh, if this sounds very off-cuff or maybe a little bit scuffed, it's because I'm uh, just recording with a microphone in front of my mouth, I haven't got it on the arm or anything. Yeah, I had a lot of fun making this video, I hope you guys enjoyed it. The intro was meant to be the Corpse Party like official blood drive opening, but because I thought this video might actually have quite a decent chance of doing quite well, I wanted to keep a hand on any revenue that I was going to get. So I bribed my pal Mwad Dog to do a rendition of the cover for me, and they managed to squeeze one out in about half an hour to an hour, which is insane. Here's their Twitter, uh, go give them a follow, they're a really talented musician, and they do their own writing stuff as well, so it's, it's worth checking out. Anyway, once again, I wanted to thank you guys very much for watching this, and I'll see you all in July for my next video.